You are listening to a Cult Talk Network podcast. For 31 days, the dead walk among the living. Things that go bump in the night no longer hide the shadow. And your darkest fears leave your mind and stand before your very eyes. A shiver on the spine, a sting on the neck, a howl in the night. This is Cult Toby, and this is Cult Toss Conspiracy. Welcome, all you believers, idealists, skeptics, and all those who question the universe around them. I'm Ty. I'm Bailey. And this is Cult Toss Conspiracy, Cultober Encounters. We're doing a episode every Tuesday this month to celebrate our favorite time of the year, Cultober. Yes! It's already in full swing. We had Hocus Pocus on Sunday. Uh, yesterday, I got to talk about uh, my favorite uh, non-Bruce Campbell shimp, Ted Raimi, and his little appearance in a creep show. Fun fact, Call to Campbell, every every Monday this month, it's coming out. Only one of those episodes actually has Bruce Campbell in it. So I've, I've kind of, my, <laughs> my show has kind of went off the rails. <laughs> I've jumped the shimp, I guess. Just, just, I'm, just, I'm um, doing anything. I'm doing uh, uh, the vaguest uh, connection I can find for Bruce Campbell. I'm just throwing in for, for content's sake. I mean, you're getting you're getting a little bit of variety, a little bit of variety, some spice variety, of life there. Variety, desperation, <laughs> you know, hand in hand. Yeah. And tomorrow we have uh, another Cultober exclusive, Killer Clowns by Outer Space. I got to introduce Bailey and Ben to that show. Awesome. Uh, I've been been bugging them for a while. Finally, finally found a reason to get them to watch it. So that made me very happy. And Cult of Lore comes out Thursday, so we are in full swing. But today we are talking about vampires. And it's not just you and I, Bailey. No. We are joined by some very special guests, our friends at the Farthest Reaches podcast. Introduce yourselves, guys. I am Matthew. And I'm Josh. And we're talking about vampires today. About yes, vampires. we are. What what in cor- in, uh, encapsulates <laughs> Halloween better than than uh, creepy, blood-sucking vampires? I even wore one of my Nostradamus shirts for this. You did. You did. That, that's very relevant. That's a relevant thing we're going to talk about. Yeah. No Sferat 2 today on this episode. I'm not uh, gonna lie. I thought we were all going to show up wearing each other's t-shirts, and I got real insecure because I don't have any t-shirts yet. So Bailey's I was cheap. That, I was like, every <laughs> time. That's a Bailey's cheap. Hold on. You ain't in a cult talk changed. conspiracy shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> You think I'm going to allow this for the next hour and a half? Oh, no. <laughs> Jeez, oh, Pete! <laughs> I love I, I, I have, zero to a hundred, like right quick. I mean, let's I be have, honest, uh, you outed yourself. I did yeah, out myself, did. but I thought that the humility was going to be enough to save me. <laughs> <laughs> I love. I, I have my cult talk conspiracy mug. I keep at the office. Yeah, that's like my. I, I love going to my coffee breaks even more. So you go to the coffee machine and get. I always have it face turned out so I can uh, spark oh, up a conversation. Oh, hey, Colt, he's got a Colt, a Colt conspiracy button on there. Oh, <laughs> that, I bet that sounds good. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, audio. I remembered. Okay. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fantastic. And uh, but yeah, Bailey, you have to get some merch. You're you're not yeah. you're not you're not repping our own oh podcast, God. let alone their podcast. We do have this uh, uh, this fabulous uh, summer at sea mug that's all pink. I fucking love it. My, I I, uh, I made one of my coworkers buy that. That's beautiful. Yeah. I love it. Mm, I kind of want it myself. It will yeah. soon be gracing my shelves. I, 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 I made I made cheap. that just so my coworker would order it. He's like, man, I like that pink uh, thing Aww. you guys have. He's got to order a mug if you had it in that. So I. I logged on to Teespring real quick. I was like, hey, are you manning your word or not? Aww. Just made it. <laughs> so he had to order it. That's beautiful. Yeah. I, that's awesome. I love oh, that. Oh, yeah. That's all my coworkers are to me is just revenue at this point. <laughs> <laughs> <It's exciting. laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's make them listen to the podcast, twist around to buy the merch. So You're like and so the, forth. the podcasting Girl Scout mom. 
Oh, I am. I I I I, I, I wore I wore the cult talk conspiracy shirt to the toy uh, toy store the other day, and the guy at work there was like, "You wearing a shirt with your face on?" I was like, "Yes, I am. It's my podcast." You like, <laughs> I don't I'll be picture. damn. Yeah, you got to. I wear my shirt. No one asked anything about it. People love your shirt. When my I wear it anywhere, I don't have people one on my shirt love yet. people love that chupacabra shirt. I, I've worn that. I wear that several places. I wore that to the uh, cool. Uh, the Columbus uh, Book Fair. I wore that. People loved that. Uh, hell, anytime, anytime I wear it out, someone's always like, "Is that Chupacabra shirt?" And I'm like, "Yeah, it's this podcast first <laughs> reaches." So, yeah. Yeah. I'm very, I'm very much that. That's me. I like the, I like the rep. The it, rep it was myself. definitely a hit at uh, Monster Fest. <laughs> It made me jealous. It It made me jealous. Yeah, Yeah, it made me jealous. I was, I was jealous. It's like you, lucky sons of bitches, came up. (laughs) (laughs) Speaking of Monster Fest, are you going to go next year? Oh, we're definitely going to go next year. Oh yeah, yeah. We actually have, we actually have like a trip budget now, so we're, we're definitely planning for that one. Good. Bailey's in charge of that, so Bailey have to That's budget for that. Taking notes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 for that <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ho- hopefully, you guys can stay tonight. Yeah, Saturday yeah, that'd be night. Fun. Mm-hmm. It, it's it's, it's far away. Like I, I was like, oh, it's in Ohio, but it, that is a uh, fucking drive. Even for me, I'm in Columbus. It's like a three hour drive for me. Yeah. Yeah. I'm definitely not about that. I would definitely stay. I, I got a bunch of Hilton points. I'll I'll cash in. Person traveling. I only stay at Hilton oh Gardens. If Hilton Gardens wants to sponsor us. I only stay at Hilton Garden Inns. That's my rule. I stay at Marriott. Oh. <laughs> I get Marriott points. Well, mine's on a company card, so I stay wherever I feel. Oh, there you go. <laughs> that's fair. That's yeah. fair. That's yeah, I just keep the points, so that's, it's a good, it's a good, good that's deal. That's a good trade. It's a good deal. Uh, <laughs> are you guys ready to talk about vampires? To, I have to been kick, ready. To kick off. Are you guys ready for Halloween? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. How, how, how much do you, how much do you, okay, we're in agreement. You're not, you you're go. not one of those, you're not those weirdos who uh, disdain Halloween. Those are the worst. I mean, I have a skeleton that lives in my car year round. So, yeah. <laughs> yep. What's his name? Bony One Kenobi. Bony One Kenobi. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, if you don't think Halloween's the best time of the year, then you're wrong. No, no, absolutely, but, absolutely. Yeah. The, the stores are even getting into it now. Like uh, Home oh, yeah. Goods and TJ Maxx and shit have their Halloween shit out middle of summer. I love it. Yeah, the, the skeleton that was rocking your guys' shirt, that is Bony One. <laughs> Bony One. <laughs> oh, you can see him on our Instagram at Cult Talk Net. It's yep. right there. Uh, wearing a shirt, you can get it. Teespring, whatever the fuck that address is. It's way too long and weird, but go to our link tree. It's there. <laughs> yeah, we don't know how he got a shirt, but somehow Bony One Kenobi did. So that's awesome. <laughs> he deserved it. He, he did. did. I'm glad I'm glad I'm glad to see him repping it. He worked himself to the bone. He should get it. <laughs> <laughs> that's terrible. I, I applaud you for that. You're hanging out with yeah. Eric. You're hanging out with Eric too much. <laughs> Eric, Eric is our ben resident. Doing it now yeah. too. Ben will just drop little zingers. <laughs> I'm like, it's uh, all infected. Worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can talk about vampires here. Uh, we're kicking things off. This is the first of our five episodes we're doing this month. Jesus. Uh, crazy. Crazy. We're doing Cult Talk Conspiracy every Tuesday. Uh, so I, I think I'll just kick things off and I'll pass it off to one of our friends in the farthest reaches, then Bailey, and then we'll cap it off with, once again, our friends from the farthest reaches. Sound All right, good, guys? Sounds like a plan. Yes, sir. All right. Let's go ahead and let's, let's bite into it. I'm going to be talking about Nosferatu, a real vampire caught on film. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty interesting theory. Uh, I've never heard of it, honestly. It's, it's great. There's a movie about it, which I I didn't. I, I remember vaguely it coming out. I haven't watched it in like years. I know my dad watched it at one point when I was way too young. So that's uh, I remember like screenshots of it. Mm. Um, so in 1922, a controversial silent film titled Nosferatu was released. Uh, upon its release, its initial controversy came from the fact that it was basically, uh, depending on what hand you want to put it in, it was either a tribute or just outright plagiarism of Bram Stoker's Dracula. Uh, the the family of Bram Stoker were not too happy with this film from the get-go. They actually won a court case, which ordered the film to be destroyed. But luckily, huh. a, f- a few copies did survive. You know, obviously, we're still able to watch it and talk about it today. But yeah, this this film on was... On my arm forever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. It's got a, got a tattoo of it. He showed me that on uh, Messenger. I had no idea you had that on there. That was awesome. Yeah. It, it got oh, destroyed. Okay. So basically, this was like the earliest like video nasty kind of. Except it was just a like, controversial film, just from the fact that they thought it was a uh, plagiarism. Uh, one, one of the one of the nails in the coffin for the film was the fact that it in the in the title card, it actually listed that it was based on Bram Stoker's Dracula. 
Yeah, because they tried to get the rights, but the widow didn't want them to. So they're like, okay, well, we already made the film, so we're just going to change the name. <laughs> yeah, change the name, Dracula like some other minor things. <laughs> but it's it's like, it's basically the same exact plot. Like It's yep. basically the same exact plot. 100%. <laughs> it's kind of like uh, what the Asylum does today. Or like the, you guys know the Asylum? I do not. The company? The movie company, yeah. The ones did Sharknado. Oh, okay. okay. Well, yeah, they, they, they'll do, like, they did like, you know, snakes on a train. Mm-hmm. Ah. Or <laughs> the trans, company that, the or, company or that makes masterpieces. Yes. Yes. My favorite movie company. I have so many of their movies. Great cover art, which much to, much to my detriment. They have great cover <laughs> art. Uh, yeah. They've got many a nine ninety nine from me that I immediately am like, damn it. They got me. Again. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I, I, t- I tell my partner Evan, like I was like, you know, summer. I was like, one thing I hate about summer is it's summer is my spend three ninety nine on a shark movie on streaming to immediately regret it. I it happens <laughs> more times than I want to admit where I'll be screw uh, cruising through Prime and see something called you know like a shark massacre or something like that, and I'll <laughs> ha- has really nice cover art, and I'll pay three ninety nine to stream it, and just you know five minutes into it, realize what I've done, <laughs> yeah. and I'm just stuck with it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Nosferatu was kind of like an early thing where you know. The asylum will just change a couple things. They release it, and it's oh, it's a a mockbuster. They call it. So Nosferatu mm. could be an early an early example of a mockbuster. But they didn't get away with it mm. like the asylum does. They got they they had they felt the heat. They got this the whole movie got destroyed except for a few copies. Um, so that's what we're able to watch today because luckily there were some copies in theaters and you know, master prints things like that. So we're able to still watch today. Mm-hmm. But that's not the controversy we're talking about today. One of the main things that people will note from Nosferatu is its central character, Nosferatu, Count Orlock, played by Max Shrek. Which Max yep. Shrek, if I'm not mistaken, is like the in Batman Returns, uh isn't he uh, uh yeah, his the mayor, um fuck who played the mayor? Uh Christopher Walken. Christopher Walken, He's, that's his character, yeah, right? That's yeah, they used uh, Tim Burton named him after as kind of like a little nod to Okay. I Max thought Shrek. so. I thought so. Like he, he'd be a good like uh, nose fraud. He'd be a count, war, count warlock. Which it's also funny because Shrek is German for fright. Mm-hmm. So is it really? Yes. So it is perfect for yeah. somebody to play a horror character. So is Shrek supposed to be a horror movie? No, because it's not spelled the same way. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> they are rebooting Shrek, so maybe it will be a horror film. Thank God. Here for it. Thank God. Here for it. <laughs> I don't know about it. A horror version? I'm here oh, for it. A horror it. version? Okay. Yeah, because yeah. then we I actually get that. to see what he does to the humans. Yeah. Hey, I hear Shrek is love, Shrek is life. <laughs> oh, my God. That, that's a horror film right there. <laughs> That's a horror film. That 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 yeah. that video blew my mind the first time I watched it when I was younger. Oh, I'm sure it did. Thirty one days of Halloween. Definitely go check that one out. <laughs> uh, Do you mind fucking with my clock, Jimmy? It's a flashlight. It's right. It's fake foot hunting. Oh, for yes. this honey. It's literally a gibbet for my Crocs. Oh, <laughs> I thought you said a crotch gibbet, and I was like, "Wow, the CFR guys are super friendly over there." <laughs> Woo! Damn, Bailey, calm down. <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness. That's how I got distracted by the little mini flashlights that are on the desk. I didn't think they were. I am literally armed head to toe in Bigfoot gear when I go out looking. Oh, nice. Anytime he goes outside. Well, you got to be. You got to be yeah, ready. Yeah, you got to be ready. I'm going to the gas station or going to Walmart for bread and eggs. <laughs> Oh, he's back. <laughs> <laughs> so Max Shrek, uh, there was there was a film critic by the name of Ado Cryu, and he was one of the first people to ever like publicly state this. He's a film critic, and he was uh, he was transfixed by Max Shrek just his appearance. You know, he's this very gaunt, pointy eared, demon looking guy. He's a very weird looking guy. That one that one of the craziest things about Nosferatu, if you see the pictures and stuff. Not a whole lot of that isn't really Max Shrek. Like they didn't, they did very little to make him look like Nosferatu. <laughs> uh, and and little is known about Max Shrek. There's not a whole lot known about him. He had a small film career uh, outside of Nosferatu, but not a whole lot. And uh, this is thought to have been deliberate by the film studio to keep Max away from public attention. You know, kind of like early. I don't know what you call that. What is that? Uh, like you know, Cloverfield and shit does it. Uh, like a publicity kind of thing. You know, they're, they're, they're keeping them oh, away. Like you know, mm-hmm. you know how a lot of found footage movies will intentionally hire, uh, you know, little known <laughs> actors and stuff just to, you know, yeah. kind of increase the realism. 
so maybe that was just an intentional thing by the studio, you know, hire this guy, really weird looking, put him in this horror movie, and then just kind of hide him away so no one gets, you know, dulled by seeing him all the time. Right. Or was it uh, maybe to hide what Max Shrek actually was? Uh, Max Shrek is believed by many to be an actual vampire. Uh, yeah, that's why he looks the way he does is because he's believed to be an actual vampire caught on film, which if you're going by Vampire 2000 rules, he wouldn't pop up on camera. But maybe that's just yeah. Yeah. that movie. But uh, so I, I guess because, you know, vampires, they can't see the reflection. So would a vampire even show up on film? I guess would be the <laughs> the I guess the argument there. Um, that's I think interesting. Yeah, that, that, yeah, that theory, I, which I've heard before, does tie in just a little bit into the story that I have okay. about tr- trying to see vampires. Ooh. Now, Stefan Ekoff, uh, who was Max's biographer, so this guy had a biographer, which I don't know if that's just a thing of the times. People just had biographers. Uh, I said, don't know. Yeah, he was. He just said that you know, Max just a con- he was just a, a loner. He he just was a weird guy who just really enjoyed grotesque things. He liked being oh, so scary. Like yeah, he liked, he, liked, he liked being scary. <laughs> he liked people being afraid of him. He just liked weird stuff. Yeah. yeah. He would actually um, he would actually star in over 40 films, which not no one no, none of them ever reached uh, the height of notoriety that Nosferatu would. Mm-hmm. Cryu, the, the film critic, his theory was, that behind the character Nosferatu was Nosferatu himself, the actual vampire. Many people have reported that a lot of the scenes for Nosferatu were intentionally filmed at night. It could be because of lighting, or it could have been because Max Shrek just couldn't have been out in the, he can't be out in the day. Maybe. But Max, I uh, do cry you, believes that Nosferatu is actually evidence of the very first vampire to ever be caught on film. Uh, further fueling this theory is Max Shrek's name, which you know, Josh talked about, uh, actually means, was it terror? Is that what it's translated to? Uh, fright. Fright, which that's a weird thing. It's a weird coincidence. Mm-hmm. The guy's in horror films. He's playing a vampire. His last name is Fright. Yeah. Um, after 100 years of it being released, which adds another thing, too. This movie is 100 years old. I think it's 101 years old now. I think last year yeah. might have been the 100th anniversary. Yeah, so 1922. Yeah, last year would have been the 100th anniversary. So 100 years of this film being out, and this is still something that people still debate whether or not yeah. Max Shrek is a was a real vampire. Maybe it he might still be a vampire lurking around somewhere in some yeah, Transylvanian knows? castle. Um, I can only hope. A very interesting <laughs> thing is there is a 2000 uh, movie starring Willem Dafoe as so Max good. Shrek. I I need to watch it again. I really do. Yeah, it's uh, so good. Called uh, was it called Shadow of the Vampire? It's got that, John Malkovich in it. Yep, hmm. John Malkovich. No. Does John Malkovich play? No, you know, Willem Dafoe he, plays. John Malkovich yeah, Willem Dafoe play plays. Uh, yeah, Willem Dafoe plays Shrek, not Shrek too. Uh Malkovich is uh, the director. Okay. F.W. Murno. John Malkovich Manhattan. now especially would probably be a good oh, uh, Nosferatu. Yeah, what about Danny that would... DeVito? That'd be good. That'd be good. I'd watch it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd watch, watch it. the fuck out of that too. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fun. You could be like Yas for a tip. <laughs> no, they, they, they'd, they'd ruin it and cast like uh, the dude that played Joker. What's his name? Uh, oh. Joaquin like Jared Leto. Jared Leto. Or they'd Jared play, Leto. They'd cast Jared Leto in there. <laughs> they'd have to like. They'd have to like you know kick him off set for sucking the blood out cats and shit because he can get through it. Through it. <laughs> he's fucking murdering yeah. cats. <laughs> just in the, in the fucking room. And finger painting with her blood. <laughs> yeah, finger painting all over the other cast yeah, members. Yeah. I mean, Jared Leto's trying to bite me on the neck. <laughs> he's getting really into he's character. He's stalking okay. around her hotel at night. He does method acting, okay? It's just his thing. Well, uh, I mean, that, that's one thing with Shrek. Maybe he was just a method actor before his time, because I know yeah, uh, could've been. In, in reading stories about it, he would stay in character, stay in like the costume and everything off set like there's one of my favorite behind the scene pictures it's just him sitting on a bench and it's just he just looks all sad and sulky Aww. <laughs> that's, that's, that's one sad. of the i need that toonie terror that's like one of the toonie terrors on this and that's, that's the line i collect i collect the the neck of toonie terrors i still need to pick up a black and white nose for to at some point but yeah that's that's my my vampire encounter did we actually see a hundred years ago uh, max shrek a real life vampire right before us on film, immortalized uh, forever, much as a vampire would be immortalized yeah. forever. He's he might still be out there. 
Uh, actually, I hope so. There is actually a uh, remake of Nosferatu coming out here soon by Robert Eggers, mm-hmm. the guy who did The Witch and The Lighthouse and uh, all that stuff. Um, Billy doesn't like The Witch. I don't like The Witch. I yeah. have. Oh, really I thought you were hopes. talking about The Lighthouse. I haven't seen that yet. I like The Lighthouse. Lighthouse is great. Lighthouse is great. Witch is a little, the, a little slog. Even the uh, the 1979 remake was pretty good too. Like there I, hasn't been a bad version of. Nostra, I've cool. always seen that ni- the 1970s one, and that looks like fucking John Malkovich. Yeah, I can that see looks that. Like John Malkovich yeah, and, and a vampire and a vampire costume. Uh, that was my encounter. Max Shrek, Nosferatu, a real vampire caught on film. It's up for debate. People still really mm-hmm. like that that theory. Yeah. Um, so I'm now gonna, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be that person that tells everybody to just go watch the movie. It's on YouTube because it's in public demand. Oh, so. yeah. yeah. Is it really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's 100 years old. No one's alive that owns that movie. Oh, okay. I see. Yeah. I see. That. Like, it feels main. like it was one of those things that they were like, we're going to release and beg forgiveness rather than ask for permission, or at least that's what it yeah. kind of turned yeah. into. So, which can be admired, can be admired. So, I, I've, I've, I've been learning of the public domain stuff just for my own, like, you know, wanting to use things. So I've been, I've been learning yep. myself on what public domain stuff is. Well, like uh, Night of the Living Dead, uh, George yep. Romero's film, it's in public demand. That's why so many mm-hmm. horror films have characters watching that movie because they can just use it. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's, that's why, that's why every year there's like a billion uh, uh, Night of the Living Dead DVDs because people can just yep. put it on a DVD because they, they, they fucked themselves in that. But a lot, a lot of stuff like that. Christmas Carol. Yep. That's that's uh, that's, that one. Yeah. That's a uh, public domain. Fucking all kinds of stuff is. But uh, let's hear from our farthest reaches fans. Which uh, friends? Which one of you guys is going first? Which one? Uh, who, who's who's kicking go. off on your? Who's going he'll, second? He'll yeah. He'll let me go. Oh, <laughs> so, I'll go first. Oh God. Let me try going. And Matthew my is going. Here. Matthew's going. Yay. Okay, so <sighs> I, I took a little bit of a different approach to this. Okay. Because to each his own. for me. For me personally, I'm not a big fan when it comes to vampires. No. So I think to myself that not the Twilight only real guy. thing, mm, no, I, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll watch the movie and I, I stand with anyone that enjoys it. But for me, it's not my cup of tea. Mm. Mike's going to be so upset. <laughs> Mike, is a big, uh, Mike our producer, is a big Twilight fan. <laughs> hey, to each, like you said, to each their own. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I'm happy to hear you like it. Uh, my wife absolutely loves it. She's probably seen it over a thousand times. Every I- single film. I have a bunch of original Twilight Barbie dolls if she wants them, like collectible items. What? Yes. I was a massive Twilight fan. So I have these collectible Barbie dolls. I have Bella, Edward, uh, Rosalie. I think I have, I have a few. I have quite a few. If she wants them, let me know. I will ship them. Do you have Charlie? I don't think so. He's the only person I agree with in that movie because he just goes, fuck (laughs) this. That is his motto. Okay. It's like, I'm done. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll have to ask her about that because she might want those. I don't know. But so, yeah, the only real thing I would say in the world of vampires that I can probably agree that to some extent is real are vampire hunters mm. or perhaps a party of people that get together to hunt vampires. Okay. Kind of the same with, you could say, just about anything this day, like, say, Bigfoot. Perhaps Bigfoot's not real. But what is real are people that really go after them. Mm-hmm. and try and look for them and hunt them down. So for my entry, and I literally just stumbled across this today, and I thought, oh, this is pretty interesting. I haven't heard of it before, so I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, I found two sources that talked about it, MysteriousChicago.com and DeadInChicago.com. And they talk about the vampire hunt in Lincoln Park, Chicago, Illinois, 1888. So it says, in September of that year, People in Lakeview gathered in a little place on Clybourne, just above Fullerton, at which Justice of the Peace, Albert Thaustrom, told them all about some real cases of vampirism, which typically, uh, at least now, how we look at that, vampirism were just cases of tuberculosis, or otherwise known as consumption. Right. And those were running rampant, and locals typically blamed vampires before they really knew what the disease was. So even in the 1880s, there were still instances in rural areas, particularly in New England, when consumption was blamed on vampires and bodies of the suspected ghouls would be dug up and mutilated. Because if they thought someone was a vampire, they would literally open up their graves and something about the decomposing body would be weird. Maybe it wasn't as decomposed as they thought it would be. Maybe it had 
what appear to be blood around their mouth because they're like, well, they shouldn't have any blood in their bodies. They've been dead for months or whatever. Mm -hmm. So what they would do is a whole bunch of different methods. They would take a stake, stab it through the heart. They would put like a brick or something underneath their mouths or something like that to prevent them from using their mouths for any blood sucking or shit like that. Um, So sometimes even the heart of someone that they had dug up was burned in a public spectacle before the whole town. And then the ashes would be fed to the local consumption sufferers in order to try and prevent it. Jesus. Albert Thalstrom here, he related all these stories to a crowd in his own bookstore and then turned over the floor to someone named Samuel Patton, who claimed that he himself had been plagued for years by a vampire after evil spirits had killed his children. Oh. So not a lot can be found on Samuel Patton, uh, but during his talk at Thalstrom's place, when 10 years old, he saw a lantern-like light in a field as he proclaims it was like a star of the first magnitude, and he watched it for a couple hours. He described it as a premonition. Patton also spoke of having precognitive dreams during his service in the Civil War of strangers whom he would later meet when returning home. Oh, that's weird. Lan- lantern, I- lantern-like ghost light reminds me of the light you and I saw. <laughs> yeah, a little side note. Um, back in the day, we would do like zombie LARPs. Oh. Which if, which if you're not sure what those are for anyone even listening, um, you basically just act out like zombies. Some people might act out like people that aren't zombies, like survivors, you could say. They have Nerf guns or something like that, and you run around in the woods, and you try and shoot each other like real fucking cool people do. <laughs> we didn't do a whole lot of acting like the Lipers now. We weren't that We weren't that into it. But. No, but I mean, we would have gatherings of maybe, <laughs> say, like 12 people. Four of us would be like survivors. The other eight would be zombies. They'd run around in the dark, and we would just try and find them and shoot the shit out of them. <laughs> um, but there was one time that we were at a friend's property kind of back far in the woods and the woods was separated in half uh, by a fence line, which, well, half of it was actual woods. The other half was like their yard, their backyard. And me and a friend, Joey, who we keep exclaiming is a no bullshit type of person. You know, he, he's pretty straightforward. Were you there or was it, you were there? And I think one other, but we saw this light and it literally looked like a lantern almost floating through the air as if someone was walking with it. And we didn't think anything of it. And when we went back to the rest of the party, we were talking about it. And they were all looking at each other like, that wasn't us. Oh, we have no, no clue what that was. And didn't another group see it too, I think? I think maybe another group of party group of the party saw it, thinking that someone was over there, finding out that no, nobody was over there. Um, but yeah, that was just really weird. And that's what me and him just thought of when I went over this in the story here. <laughs> um, but anyway, back to the story. Uh, yeah, Patton spoke of precognitive dreams during his ser- service in the Civil War of strangers whom he let uh, or he later met when returning home. He had fathered five children, all of which unfortunately had died, including his eight-year-old son, Willie, who he said came out of his grave a week before. After he was buried, after marveling at spirit photography and experimenting with spirit manifestations, uh, which people assume he was into that type of stuff after the loss of his children to try and communicate with them, he began experiencing pain on his forehead, resulting from words being carved into his forehead from the quote unquote spirit realm. This included his dead son's signature. After a while of this, he went to wearing a silk covering on his forehead. Uh, which for some fucking reason he thought would <laughs> stop the ghost from just boop, boop, yeah, makes boop, sense. Him. <laughs> but the, as it says here that the ghost could still poke through it. Huh? Okay. He learned that the spirits had tortured and killed his children and that they were not the race of humans, but made of quote unquote cones and bubbles. Oh, I have okay. no fucking clue what that means. <laughs> cones and no bubbles. clue at all. Um, apparently one of the ghosts would even sing to him while, <laughs> while poking his head. Let's see if I can do this so you guys get a full reenactment here <laughs> while I poke Josh's head. Over there, where all is prayer, I'll sit and swear. Hoorah for me. Hoorah for me. That's what happened. I'm going to lose my mind. <laughs> Don't be so disturbed. I uh. wouldn't hate my life. <laughs> I'd burn the whole fucking house down. I'd move. <laughs> um, but after the spirits became tired of poking him and singing, they told him that they sent a vampire after him. Oh. 
the vampire had a human shape and sucked through its mouth and nostrils. It put a quote unquote poison vapor spot on Patton's head that apparently the vampire had exhaled like a spray towards Patton. And then Patton claimed that those who had touched it had committed murder and he called it the poison of the vampire. Ah, so it's like the ninjas that had like the poison mist. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, inspired by the spirit photography and manifestations, this is what I was referring to, Ty, when you were giving your story, mm-hmm. he had invented a clairvoyant varnish for glasses to help people see vampires and spirits without the aid of cameras. Mm-hmm. Oh. He explained how the varnish worked. Quote, there is a thin covering of the eye which is thrown outward when we look steadily for an object. When this covering strikes the varnish on the glass, it becomes clear and people in spirit life may be seen dimly moving about. End quote. Uh, this probably would have seemed fairly logical to people who believed in spirit photography. If cameras can make a ghost appear, no, shouldn't there be some kind of accessory to allow entities like such to become visible without the aid of a camera? So, like I said, the vampires couldn't be seen with a naked eye, but Patton was given out these samples, which uh, were, call- were called Patton's Clairvoyant Varnish for Glass, which he sold for a dime. And he assured people that the vampire was flying up and down Paulina Street right then and there. Oh. Mm. Uh, so a few buyers insisted that they saw it, though the reporter uh, reporting for the Chicago Tribune at the time seemed very skeptical. He didn't see anything. Um, but even in the ensuing days and months after, uh, it was fairly quiet until someone named Klaus Larson went missing and his wife blamed the vampire just after Halloween of 1888. The neighborhood came into some excitement and a group of kids formed a team that they called the Vampire Hunters. And they went on a hunt through Lincoln Park to find the demon. And for anyone that didn't know, Lincoln Park in Chicago, since there's multiples, had actually been a cemetery in recent memory before they made the park over it. So there's probably no doubt that there are still some bodies buried there. And I made a note to myself that I almost have to imagine that Samuel Patton probably organized this group himself, Mm -hmm. uh, maybe even ready to sell some of the parents some accessories on things, (laughs) since I get this con artist type of idea from him. Yeah, definitely like snake oil salesman kind of vibes. Yeah, Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah. But it's hard to tell just how serious this scare was. Uh, The Chicago Tribune indicated that the Lakeview area was in a state of excitement and might have just been making fun of people that were present who were taken in by a flashy pitch at a medicine show. Surely, if the parents thought a real vampire was on the loose, they wouldn't have let their kids go running about looking for it. Right. (laughs) But actually, about a month's time of this Klaus Larson going missing, he showed up. He returned. And he admitted that he had just been on a bender. No. <laughs> <laughs> what a twist. I'm having a me moment. Wow. Twist. Leave me alone. <laughs> but that's basically the story. There are some pension records that indicate that Patton really was in the Civil War. Um, he was a blacksmith by trade. And then the judge, Thalstrom, really was a judge and a pe- uh, keeper of the peace and such like that. So there are some facts to the story. But like I said, I don't buy into really many vampire stories myself. I enjoy the topic, but I I like more so of the aspect of vampire hunters and the cons that go on about it than I do the actual vampires themselves. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was my entry I thought I'd share. Interesting. That was cool. I like that. Snake wheels, man. I love that. Taken to thinking about it because we were talking about like reflecting, like we're seeing like vampires and the reflections mm-hmm. and stuff. I think that whole concept came because I think back in the day, mirrors were made like the backs of them were made of silver. Yeah, I and think so. That was supposed to be the whole like that makes why sense, vampires yeah. can't see the reflection mm-hmm. and that stuff. That makes sense. Yeah, I always remember in like Vampire and Dracula 2000, it's uh, where uh, I guess Gerard Butler plays Dracula in that. I remember he like kills this like news crew when it's like it shows it through the camera perspective where it's like mm-hmm. it's just like this invisible force just you know, mutilating these people. I always like that. That's like one of the few that jet highlights cool that movie. Fuck. Yeah, it's I've bad. never seen that movie. That Dracula two thousand. Cool. I think it's Wes Craven. I think it's a Wes Craven movie. <laughs> but I, I can't right. imagine Gerard Butler being Dracula though. I still think my favorite like representation of vampires in like recent memory is still Thirty Days of Night. Oh, that was yeah, that's yeah. A brutal. So yeah. fucking gnarly. Yeah, I love those. Same. All right, no. Bailey, what, what do you got for us? 
oh, uh, I'm going to be talking about probably one of the coolest vampire lures I've ever heard. Uh, the casting. I got to say, I look. I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. Casting Girls. No, I'm just saying, I looked that up because I had never, ever heard of that. Uh-huh. And that story is fucking sweet it's sounding. It's wild. And I really, really like it. Wild. There's, it's it's a wild story followed by an evil wilder truth, which is absolutely amazing. Um, mm-hmm. So our story takes place in New Orleans in the early 1700s in the Ursuline Convent. So the basic legend behind the Casket Girls is that America at the time in the early 1700s was actually being used as a penal colony for both France and the UK. So they were sending all of their prisoners over to the Americas, basically like our prisons are overrun. You're going to go over to the Americas. You're going to build a new life there. You're going to build colonies over there. You're just going to be over there and not going to (laughs) worry about you. So bye. So that's where they got sent. And then after the Revolutionary War, which happened later in the 1700s, um, that site then became that of Australia. Before we got there, so the reason these unfavorable men were here were to colonize, live, and work, and to populate the new land in which they dwelled. But there was one problem. They did not send any women with these men. Oh, Oh, man. (laughs) man. They're all going to go gay. There's is that no what the story way. goes? No. <laughs> this, is, this is terrible. Yeah, no is this way. the truth you were talking about? Yeah, this is it. <laughs> we're getting the there. What the fuck's going on? <laughs> we're getting there. <laughs> so the, the surrounding <laughs> Native American American tribe, the Chitimacha, we're so excited because that that's a that Starbucks printed. drink. <laughs> that's, a, that's a cinnamon matcha right there. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Give me a um, but they were actually not a big fan of the new French colonist men that were there now because they then started chasing after the Native American women to fill their needs. Wow. So Go figure. Yeah, everyone, nobody is happy at this point. So a little tidbit into history, and we're only going to touch on it. There's actually two brothers that own both New France, which was Montreal and Quebec. And, Quebec, and there was another brother that owned New Orleans, New Orleans, um, which has a very big fancy, fancy French name. We've all heard my pronunciations. Well, I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, <laughs> all right, fair enough. So... <laughs> so the brother, then the brother of the owner of Quebec and Montreal, New France, he had actually sequestered or inquired to King George II at this time um, to send over women to help colonize and help populate mm. the new uh, world in New France at the time of Quebec and Montreal. So having this knowledge, the other brother who had New Orleans asked King George of the same. And one of these ships that carried over these women, ages ranging from 12 years old to 30 years old, were that mm. of the Casket Girls. That's a, that's a good name. A good uh, punk band name. The oh, Casket yeah. Girls. Too, there's a band yeah. out there called The Caskets. And like I kept getting their stuff as I was... Uh, same with The Reptilians. Mm-hmm. There's a band called The Reptilians, too, that I kept getting in my mm-hmm. research. I'm like, cool. I'm sure you're cool. fabulous. I just... That's what I'm looking for right now. <laughs> now is not the time. Now is not the time. I'll jam later. <laughs> So these women, the casket girls, they came from all over France and they came from prisons, brothels, and even orphanages. A lot of these women traveled in style. And when I mean that, I mean that they had coffin-shaped boxes that were sent with the women. (laughs) And these women were sent to the Ursuline Covent to be taught how to become wives and homemakers from the the nuns of Ursuline. So gross. Yep. Yep. I know, just thinking about it, like, oh, there's a 12-year-old learning all the... uh, Different times, different times, guys. We didn't know what we know now. There were a couple of things about these women that was good for them to be established with. First, the caskets were taken to the attic of the convent. So they were all the way up in the third floor. And the girls would actually live in the convent and the nuns would actually note some very strange details about the girls' daily living lives. One of which, the girls were all very pale and sickly, even after their voyage. Because, of Mm. course, um, you know, 
everyone imagined that they would, of course, have seasickness. There would, of course, you know, there wasn't a lot of food on the ship. So, of course, they would look, you know, a little a little under the gills. But, Mm -hmm. you know, after months and months and months of being there, they expected the girls to start looking a lot better, having a lot more sun. um, And that just was not happening. Part of the reason they probably looked so pale is because these girls would only go out at night and they would return in the morning and sleep all day in the attic. And has anyone here ever been to New Orleans? No. 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 Uh, Me neither. Me neither. So my father was just there and Ben also loves that. It loves New Orleans as well. It is blistering hot in New Orleans. It, it is that kind of heat that makes you want to slap Ugh. your mama. And it yeah. is just it's that don't talk back to me heat. Like <laughs> don't <laughs> <laughs> like the, watch your mouth around me. But they would stay there all day through the heat and they would rest and then they would go out in the in the night. So, and the most incriminating attribute of this information being that the men around New Orleans began popping up dead, drained completely of their blood. Ooh. Oh, drained of blood. Okay. Drained of their blood. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> oh, good. Uh, <laughs> men suck. <laughs> really no, I'm pretty sure they were people. sucked. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Um, hints of that verb. <laughs> So the nuns then (laughs) began to suspect the girls of being creatures of the night. So they then took action. One evening, while the girls were out, the nuns would actually take to the attic to go and search and to find out more about these girls that were living in the convent with them. So upon their search, they would first go directly to the caskets. And they found in these caskets that they were completely empty. They were expecting the girls' belongings to be there, you know, dresses, perfumes, uh, things that they would take over into the new land with them that would be of value, things to start up a new life, everything of that nature. There was nothing in there. There was absolutely nothing. It was empty. So this being extremely disturbing, and of course, the nature of the way that the girls were acting and presenting, as well as their amazing way of luggagery, this led the nuns to take even further action and call upon a pr- the Pope. And the Pope would send nails that were blessed by him to the convent. And these nails would be used to board up the windows in the attic and shut the girls in upon their return. So we have nails. I read somewhere that it was 800 plus nails that were blessed by the Pope and sent to the convent in order to... No, That's kind of a lot of nails. Like, yes. like big like stakes? Or like, like yeah, they're like big silver nails. Oh, shit. Did they send a hammer? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think... They expected the nuns to just... I mean, Smash their head into it? Yeah. I mean... Vampire hunting nuns. That'd be good. That's a good like, plot for a movie. I mean... I was going to say, this whole story just sounds like it'd be a really good movie. Yeah. It really does. It's amazing. Mm. It's absolutely amazing. Get on that. Um, so upon the return, the girls would be sealed inside of the attic which then would contain the evil and the wheel, the windows of the attic would never be opened again after the early 1700s. Not even on the hottest days in the summer, in the summer heat, would the windows ever be opened. Jeez. And we actually have good reason for why these windows may never have been opened. The first of which being in the 1970s or 80s, we're not too sure on the timeline there, but there were two ghost hunters who would actually access the attic of the convent as well as the surrounding grounds. And they would actually be found after their investigation drained completely of their blood, both respectively. So Jesus. this may... This happened in the 70s or 80s? This happened in the 70s or 80s. Wow. Oh my God. Yeah, two of them like had access to the grounds around that and got into the attic. And it's unclear whether or not they were found directly after the investigation or in the days leading or in the days following the investigation. But um, either way, they were found completely drained of their blood, which was an insane anomaly to happen after yeah. investigating the location of the possible casket girls. All right. Which may or may not have prompted. Pope Jonathan II, during his 1987 visit to bless not only the Ursuline convent, but to take extra special time out of his visit to specifically bless the addict. 
<laughs> this addict, which according to the public, according to reports to the public, I should say, was only used for storage of that of the Monsignor. So explain to me why the Monsignor needs his attic full of things blessed. Mm. Mm. I'm just wondering. Okay, so, I'm with you there. So to this day, no one is allowed in the attic or even to ask or even allowed to ask to go into the attic during the Ursuline convent tours, you will be asked to leave. Like this was a big thing. Like I was, Ben and I are taking our honeymoon to New Orleans. So I've been looking up like New Orleans do's and don'ts. This is like number one or number two on New Orleans do's or don'ts. You do not go into the Ursuline convent and ask to go into the attic. It's just, you will be asked to leave. They find it very disrespectful. Whether it's true or not, they're not going to tell you. They're just going to be like, you need to go. No refund. Oh, all right. Now I want to. Now I, I want to more than ever. I so mm-hmm. do why. Josh and I are just going to go one day and we're just going to be like, so about the addicts. <laughs> yeah. They're like, like well, you know, go back to yeah, Ohio. Yeah, get fuck out <laughs> of here. Take that back to Ohio. We don't respect <laughs> that here. At least we could say we get yelled at. Exactly. <laughs> at least we could say we can confirm or deny if that is true. So... In more recent times, during Hurricane Hurricane Katrina in 2005, the city of New Orleans was nearly destroyed by natural devastation. The convent would survive. However, Hmm. during the events, one of the windows would actually fly open to the attic. One of the windows that had not been opened in over 300 years. Those holy nails finally let go. Those holy nails, yep. yep. Mm -mm. It's because the hammer wasn't holy. (laughs) Just the nails. That's true. <laughs> was it? Yeah, they needed the whole. Oh, he should have blessed a hammer and taken. Yeah, he should have. Well, fucking saying. Yep. <laughs> Laziness. I know. It's like, well, I mean, I'm not going to make that joke. <laughs> oh, fuck it, I'm going to make that joke. I guess they figured that, you know, with them being so close to Jesus, they figured he would have known his way around a couple nails. I mean, mm, yep. You would think. Nice. You would think. <laughs> <laughs> I applaud that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I guess back there somewhere. Okay. Speaking <sighs> you know, of Jesus, um, some carpenter he was. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I, I might get in trouble for that one. <laughs> so speaking of Jesus, it was actually rumored that the Vatican itself sent a priest to reseal the attic and to close the window with the blessed nails in hand. The window was actually very, it was actually reported to be closed very shortly after flying open. It was super quick. I, it's not clear whether or not the evacuation times had kind of, you know, like people were allowed back into the city by the time the window had shut, but it was very clear someone yeah. had been in the building to shut the window. You uh, said Hurricane Katrina? Yeah. Correct? Mm-hmm. Huh, okay. I'm just, I don't remember ever hearing around that time the Pope coming to visit New Orleans. Oh, it was a priest. <laughs> Not the Pope. Or a priest, I'm sorry. From, I don't know. Well, they would keep it okay. super quiet if, you know, they know. were really, you know. Yeah. And plus, like, there's all kinds of, like, aid and, like, religious aid and everything there. He could have just, like, blended in with the crowd of, you know, priests yeah. and Pope. Or he not was popes, one of the leaders. The Pope was notoriously <laughs> low-key. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with his armored car. And, yeah. You know. Yeah. Like a thief in the night, he just slips in and out. All the time. Yeah, <laughs> but interesting. It's it is. Yeah, it, and it gets even creepier. So Uh-oh. the New Orleans Vampire Association is actually a real group of people. It is filled with those who say that they need blood, either animal or human, in order to survive. Also, okay. vampire culture is rampant throughout the city of New Orleans as well. And I did say how there were two brothers um, who came from France. One of them was the um, the leader of the New France in Montreal and Quebec. The other brother was in charge of New Orleans. So the Casket Girls actually were not the first girls to be sent over in order to uh, colonize and help bump up the population. The first of these women were actually called the King's Daughters, and there were 768 of these women that were sent over. And they were actually sent over after a bad batch of women. So the brother who had... <laughs> I'm not kidding, y'all. Yeah, it's all right. He's brother, no good. He's no good. They were like, they, these ain't no good. What you These sending us? Suck. <laughs> wow. So they're like oh, scraping man. the bottom of the barrel for Montreal over here. Come on. Um, <laughs> the brother actually acquiesced to the king to not only send women from good families, but to also have them carry a letter of recommendation. These women were promptly known as the king's daughters for having such a 
grandiose uh, reputation to them. And huh. they would, and 730, some of them would end up to become married as well as to produce children, therefore upping the population. We don't know what happened to the remainder of them. They didn't care about those. So the next would actually be the Pelican women. And they would be sent to uh, Bexley. And they would also be requested by the king. Um, and the other brother, the brother actually had such harsh uh, conditions for these women that only 23 of these women were sent over. The conditions were they to be, they were to be virtuous and pure as well as hardworking. So he did not want a touch of another man or of evil to be upon these women. And they also had to know about a good day's work because when you're in a new colony, you're not going to, you know, sit around and be pampered all day. You're going to be expected to also work and do mm -hmm. some of the house chores and all of that good stuff. So only 23 women fit this acquiesced. And these women, after being overwhelmed with the amount of men and obligation, would actually migrate over to New Orleans. So after this, a man by the name of Jonathan Law got involved. Johnny and Law. he started a new program in France where he would be able to get these women to, you know, colonize the cities and build up the population. That would no problem. He did it by kidnapping them. Oh, way to he, do was, it. he was like, if you can't get them to go willingly, they will go by force. Wow. Yes. So Jonathan, John would hit the streets of France and at night he would take women who he thought wouldn't be missed. These were women walking alone at night, homeless, even prostitutes. And they either didn't go willingly or they didn't go knowingly what they were getting mm. into because the living conditions that they were getting into, that it was small homes, that their the males were not favorable men. So you guys can put two and two together on that yeah. one. And yeah. they were pretty much told like, hey, you're going to have babies like right now. Nice. Get off I mean, the boat and spread your legs. It's, <laughs> a good way, it's, a good way, it's a good way to uh, cut down the amount of no's you get when you just don't ask in the first place. Yeah, I'm so. sure a lot of them <laughs> were told and explained that yeah. the life that they could have would be a lot better than what they currently are <laughs> enduring. Like you, like like what you said about, oh, not, some of them probably willingly like did not know what they no. were getting into. Yeah. They thought, I bet that was probably it. Yeah. They thought they were going like, to... Nope you know, a, a land of new dreams and of new hopes. Their yeah. bellies would always be full. They would always have a warm bed to sleep in at night. And that was not the case. They were being sold a fairy tale, which is not okay. So the leader of New Orleans actually comes back again and then asks King George for more women because <gasps> these men were out of control. <laughs> they were abusive. They were having affairs with the native women. They just, they needed Damn. proper women to put ah. them in their place and to teach them how to be respectable men. There is not a woman alive that can make a man respectable if he does not want to be respectable. Side note. I agree with that. Thank you, sir. <laughs> so after 1750, it actually wouldn't be King George who would fulfill this request. It would actually be the Parisian government, the Paris government, that would fulfill the request. And here are the Baleen Brides. These women were actually from an institution that was built by Louis XIV that housed 50,000 of Paris's less fortunates. This was a gen population of male and female people, both all living together in this giant institution, <laughs> ranging from beggars, thieves, violent people, outcasts. The women especially who were housed here didn't really have awesome living conditions. It also included children as well, as in later years, there were my, there were sections for minors that were in, that were built up, wings, excuse me. Um, so these women would actually be imprisoned for witchcraft, Protestantism, insanity, moral, immoral speech, so swearing, poisoning, murder, and debauchery. I would be locked up so Ooh. quick. They would be like witchery, immoral speech, She's she's got to go. She got to go. <laughs> she, she's got to go. They, they just hated some of the nails. They just hated groovy women back they in really the day. Did. They were not about it. It was not about it. So La Balin, the ship that would bring all of these women over, would be the birthplace of supposedly where the casket girls legend was born. It actually wasn't caskets that the girls were carrying. It was cast sets, Cats which is a sets. whole okay. different thing. It's actually a small sort of wooden uh, bag, kind of like a carry-on luggage that makes it easy to travel and can also hold some of the, your valuables as you're traveling along. A lot of these women would not have brought like extra sets of clothes, new shoes, anything like that. So what they had pretty much fit in like this 12 by 6 cassette bag. So some of these women actually may have gotten sick of tuberculosis, um, which can actually make you cough up blood like Matthew, you know, talked about earlier. Um, 
also to a big note, the Ursuline convent actually wasn't built until 1734. And that was the first building. The first building was actually built on swap land, not in the French Quarter, which had to be abandoned after the structure started uh, sinking into the floor and shifting because of the soft ground. It wouldn't be until night or it wouldn't be until 1745 that they had built their now Ursuline convent in the French Quarter. And it's actually really interesting because when the Ursuline nuns first arrived in New Orleans, the Ursuline convent wasn't completely ready yet. So they had to have different living arrangements when they first arrived into New Orleans. So they had these different living arrangements. And then once the Ursuline convent was ready, they had a parade down New Orleans to move these nuns into the convent and to basically say, God is in town now. We are here. We are going to get all of you heathens off the streets and you are just going to come to Jesus. This, however... Someone's coming. Someone's coming. <laughs> So this, however, would also prove to be a little bit more on the outside side for the Ursuline nuns because they typically traveled very discreetly, even so discreet that the nuns themselves actually traveled in covered wagons. So the fact that they were out having a parade was almost just a little bit too grandiose because then people started to question that the parade may have been a distraction from for the public in order to move the caskets into the Ursuline convent, Ooh. leading to it may have been a resting place for the vampires all along. Now, one of the only people that's ever had access to the addict was Marita Waywood Cardell. And she is an author of the New Orleans Vampires, also New Orleans Native. And she was able to get into the addict. And a couple notes from her is she actually explained that the attic is not just one giant space. Her tour guide explained to her that it's actually six different rooms within the attic that was originally meant to house orphans and then later sickly people. Never used for storage. The tour guide was very clear. It's never been used for storage. So Marita noted that the there was an emptiness to the attic, that it's like there's all this different space within, you know, there's not a lot of space within the French Quarter. So for there to be that much storage that's just not being used, it just looks really, really odd. Um, <laughs> there was actually another room within the attic that was also suspect as it was not only separate, but it had pieces of the floor missing out of it. Marita noted it actually looked like spaces where coffins could fit into the floor. Wow. Even more strangely, most of the attic was covered in a wood floor. However, there was one separate, smaller, and darker room that was covered with brick floor and had a Dutch oven, which meant that there were or a Dutch oven door, which meant that the door could open from one side. There would be a receiver on the end, but you could only open and shut the door from the one side, kind of like how a mailbox is. Okay. Like one of the postal mailboxes where you just drop your uh, mail mm -hmm. into and then it's poof, gone. Um, forever. Forever. It's gone forever because <laughs> we don't know what the postal system's doing now. But it also, it had this brick floor as well. And even strangely, there was a heavy chain that would hang from the ceiling. Her tour guide explained to Marita that this was actually put in place by the nuns because the nuns at one point took care of the mentally ill as well as people considered insane. And the brick she was explained to was actually much easier to clean up than what the wood would be because the wood would absorb the smells and the soak and all of that where the brick you could just spray it off with. So according to them, according to the people of the Ursuline convent, the nuns were taking care of orphans, sickly people, doing all the good stuff. Um, the vampires are just, you know, unfavorable women. There were no vampires and we do not have <laughs> vampires in our attic. However, the people of New Orleans may have a different story to tell. That was so cool. <laughs> That's pretty dope, yeah. That was, dope. I, was also, yeah. I was like, you see what I mean by this is one where the story is strange, but the truth is even stranger on that. Like, yeah, was, yeah. My thing is, is like, I just want to know, like, why they won't talk about it. Like, it, it's a part of your culture at this point. Now you have to talk about it. I don't know anything that has a, a, a touch of religious aspect to it. It seems like it's so just well kept shut. I don't care what type of quote unquote secret it is, mm -hmm. but 
I mean, that makes me think of, um, um, I think it's in like Tibet or something. There's some monastery that claims they have like a Yeti foot. Yeah, a Yeti, yeti like scalp. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. Scalp, yeah, that's right. Scalp, yeah, yeah. yeah, And they, they basically forbid anyone to come in there and touch it and desecrate There's it. There's actually a uh, explorer. I think he was an American explorer back in the, uh, I think like the 70s that actually uh, broke in and took some of the, the hair from it. Good uh, had it tested and it was inconclusive, but the, the monks claim that that was actually like a decoy. Okay. So, it's up for debate. You didn't. Oh, no. Yeah. No tourism anymore. <laughs> yeah. Damn. Well, let's let's go ahead and let's keep it rolling. Uh, let's go on with That's you. Josh, what you Josh, got? It's, it's- so, mine is the vampire tale of Peter Blag- Blagojevic. I'm just going to call him Peter because his last name is a pain in the ass yeah. to say. Foreign and uh, yeah, not right. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> Peter's smart. Peter's tale is one of the earliest, like from like the vampire mania of like the uh, 1700s and stuff yeah. in Eastern Europe. Europe. This is like one of the most uh, notorious cases, but I'll try to keep it somewhat short and sweet. So Peter was a resident in Kislova, which is a hamlet in uh, Serbia. He died in 1725, and when he died, like over the course of nine days, eight other of his fellow villagers passed away as well. There was a few that were on their deathbeds, and the ones that lived claimed that Peter visited them and basically beat them half to death. (laughs) (laughs) Then Peter's wife also claimed that she was visited by Peter, and he asked to have his shoes. Okay. She panicked. She moved on to a different village. And then there's some other cases that say that Peter returned to his home, asked his son for food, and his son said no, that he was supposed to be dead, and he then turned and killed his son. Why wouldn't you just give him his Doc Martens, man? (laughs) (laughs) Right. So the villagers, obviously, you know, they started going into manic mode, as the villagers do. I mean, we all saw how they reacted during the uh, Salem witch trials, especially in Eastern Europe. Yeah, They were crazy over there. So they ended up getting with one of their local priests and they decided to dig up the body and check it out. They found that the body had hair that had grown, fingernails that had grown, his beard hair had grown, and the body did not show the typical signs of decomposition as it should. Now, we realize today a lot of times when like, because your hair, they say that your hair does, like people think that your hair continues growing, but that's just because as your skin gets tighter and tighter, the hair follicles and stuff just look like they're becoming longer. Yeah, Ugh. I don't know the full. I don't know the full science about it, but that's the basically what I understood from it. Um, but when they opened up the casket and saw that, and they realized that he also had looked like he had remnants of blood around his mouth, so the villagers panicked and took a stick, stabbed the heart. And the weird thing is when they stabbed the heart, what they described as fresh blood began to pour from the mouth and ears of the corpse. Hmm. The mouth <laughs> and ears. Yeah. So they, huh. so, after, so after the staking, they decided to take the corpse out of the ground and decided to burn it so that they could <laughs> rid of any <laughs> vampire incrimination. <laughs> yeah. Shit. Yeah. Like you do. Yep. Yeah, as, like one yeah does. definitely, as you do. So he's been so that uh, He was staked and burned, and I guess, you know, they didn't have any more deaths for a long time. I guess they looked at the eight people that died before him, and one or two people said they, they were visited by Peter, and we were like, he's a fucking vampire. <laughs> yeah, and he, for some reason, so logical <laughs> had a vendetta up. for some and yeah. beat yeah. the shit out of people. My favorite part of that whole story, though, is... I, I want to know why he went to his house. It's just like, let me have my shoes. <laughs> like, I, I need my shoes to do my vampire work. <laughs> well, yeah, he's barefoot. <laughs> but he's dead. You shouldn't care. The stone streets are cold. Yeah. This yeah, is true. He's, he's probably got yeah. little, little baby feet. Yeah. He doesn't want to, you know, get something stuck in him. And plus, like, he's got to ask his wife, like, she's going to know where the shoes are. They might have been, uh, yeah. been prescription shoes. They might have had, they might have had like, some sort of yeah, or an issue. Like, he has, he has a, he's I flat-footed. Need, I, need my doc, I need my Dr. Scholl. Yeah. <laughs> now, his son refused him food. That's what I'm pissed yeah. about. Yeah. yeah. Don't do that. No. And that's only in some cases because, you know, how a lot of those stories are. There's different tales mm-hmm. that happen. Probably. Right. I had never but, heard of that. That's very interesting. That's wild. Yeah. Peter Pop. That's one of, like, the first... It, vampire cases. Yeah, it's one of the first like 
like on Earth, you could say that's most documented and stuff. But yeah, it's very interesting. Like if you dive deeper into the story, it, it, it's very interesting. But it's just the whole like after they stabbed it that it started bleeding. That makes me wonder. Well, I can see the, the mouth bleeding, but I don't understand why the ears would be bleeding. Yeah, how long was I he mean, dead for? Do you know? That's what I was going to say. It didn't add from the articles that I was reading. It didn't say, mm-hmm. but um, I because well, I'm not sure if they because it was like over the course of nine days that the eight people died. I don't know if it was like on that ninth day or tenth day they decided to dig them yeah. up. <laughs> yeah, because the last guy in that street's trembling. Oh man, I'm next. Oh, <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> get that guy up there. Because I, so I know my life is at stake. <laughs> <laughs> I, love I had to put my own point. It's all done. Right. I love done. it. <laughs> but that shouldn't even have happened because, like, typically, like a day or two after death, like everything just kind of like, from what I understand, I'm not like a mortician or anything like that. Everything just kind of like seeps down, like the like blood spreading yeah. within you. Like it's just like it's not supposed to go anywhere. So that's why yeah. I'm well, kind of like, what the fuck? Like, well, the one thing I hear about it comes back to consumption again. Yeah, because while the body does does kind of release all of its fluids and whatnot. Um, since with consumption, especially, you can get blood in the lungs. Oh. The lungs can preserve it a little bit longer. And that's why, like, when you say, like, the nose mm-hmm. or, like, the mouth, I can see blood coming out of that, even if it's weeks or months later. But the ears, I that I don't understand. Yeah, yeah and, like, the articles didn't really explain, like, his cause of death probably at that time. They didn't know. But having blood around your mouth, how he could have had tuberculosis mm-hmm. and was coughing up blood and that would explain yeah, the blood common. around the mouth. Mm-hmm. The ears though, because the ears would point yeah. to something more like neurological, I would imagine. You would think, yeah. yeah. The brain, yeah. yeah. Romania well, has this really cool um, like village where like they still, I don't know if they still do it because I watched this documentary and it was like 10 years old, but um, where like if someone's suspected of being a vampire, they will still like put cages over top of the grave yep. and everything. Like it, it's wild. It is Dude, so Eastern Europeans are fucking wild with their yeah folklore. Interestingly enough, those cages, which I think I've heard them called like graph diggers cages mm-hmm. or something like that. If I, if I think that's what you're talking about, I just watched a video today of people explaining that those cages apparently weren't to keep things in like vampires, mm-hmm. but they were to keep people out oh. because at that time people would dig up those bodies and sell them to, I don't know, doctors yeah. or morticians or whatever to study the bodies. Uh-huh. And apparently people didn't want to offer their bodies up. So people would, I think they were called resurrectionists. Oh, yeah, yeah. They would take the bodies and they would sell them and whatnot and get a bunch of money for it. So they put those cages over them to make them stop. That's interesting. Cool. Uh, unless that's a fallacy. <laughs> That's the cover-up. God, goddamn Dr. Frankenstein. <laughs> and interestingly enough, you just saying Romania, our friend Gabe, mm-hmm. <clears throat> who had just recently, well, I say recently, but it's been a few years since he's been married. Um, but he has told me, just told me, so I guess I don't really have any scientific proof, that he's Romanian. Okay. And some of his extended family, you could say, came to the wedding. And when I say that these motherfuckers <laughs> looked like vampires, oh, I mean, <laughs> like, like there was literally one guy probably as tall as me that had a black top hat, long black trench coat and cane and literally just walked so slowly everywhere. I was like, yep. This is not a wedding. Yeah, this is a gathering Max for everybody's blood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but well, this was this was great. Go. Vampire encounters, <laughs> the first our first cult talk conspiracy of cult tober. Before before we leave, I, I thought it'd be cool to leave on like something. So I was like thinking of a way to end it. What is your favorite vampire movie? There we go. We're doing cult tober. Oh. This month's all about horror movies. Um, uh, Bailey, what's your favorite horror? Uh, favorite vampire movie? <laughs> Yeah, Bailey, go first. Yeah, me go first. All right. Okay. Um, <laughs> I had a couple pop in my head. Honestly, oh my god, interview with a vampire. I kept wanting to say Diary of a Vampire, and I'm like, that is not the fucking name of it. Interview vampire Diaries. Vampire, vampire Diaries. Diaries. Yeah, that was probably what <laughs> that was a show that I did watch and I didn't quite cling to. Um, interview mm. with a Vampire is probably my favorite, uh, just because there's so much story there, and like, there's just uh, it's beautiful. It is beautifully visual it's it, it, it's 
the writing is absolutely gorgeous and just the twists and turns of that movie. Plus it was like one of the very first, like, I guess adult films I ever really watched, like as a kid or teenager, like that was the big rated R for mm, me. So okay. sure. What about, what about uh, you, Sky? You want me? Okay. Uh, my favorite, it's gotta be a toss up between um, probably Lost Boys. I love the original Lost Boys. <sighs> That's awesome. That is a uh, fantastic movie. God, that, that movie uh, the sequels to that are really fucking bad, <laughs> but for whatever oh, yeah. reason, for a reason, I just I love them. Even even though I, I I have a thing just for seeing the two Corys, I like seeing them. But it'd be toss between Lost Boys and Near Dark mm-hmm. uh, with Bill Paxton and Lance Henriksen. Uh, that is a great like modern vampire western. That I, I I love that movie so much. I try to explain it to people. It's a hard movie to explain, but it is. It is a fantastic fucking movie from the eighties. Not people, not not enough people have seen that movie. Oh, I haven't. So that's one oh, more. It's awesome. <laughs> We're gonna have to get a party yeah. together. And oh, watch it's, it. it's awesome. It's we, Lance Henriksen, Bill Paxton. Yeah, you got. We, we need to do that because I have a theater here at my apartment. We we use mm-hmm. quite a bit. It's a big theater room that we rent out. But yeah, we'll have to do that. Movie nights are fun. Yeah. But yeah, New Dark is a good one. It, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, that that's a great one. Yeah, Lance Henriksen, Bill Paxton running around in a blacked out RV just hunting Ooh, people through yeah. Texas. Mm-hmm. It's great. Yeah. What, what about you guys? <laughs> Man, I have no idea. <laughs> I don't I don't know if there's any real one specifically oriented like vampire movie that I like above others, but I mean, I enjoy like the 1992 Dracula with Gary Coleman. So that's a good one. It's a uh, freaky one, yeah. Um, oh yeah. For for whatever reason, whenever I think about werewolves and Frankenstein and vampires and alike, I always think of Van Helsing with Hugh Jackman. That's a fun movie. That's a fun fun movie. It really is. That that was Um, a fun way to just blend all those together. People mm -hmm. don't give enough credit. That was, that was a great movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, you even got Jekyll and Hyde. Yeah. 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 That was fun as fuck. Um, 30 days a night. That's a good one. Mention that of course. I do like me some slaughter. Um, but hell, even like thinking of any of the movies or series or, or whatever that popped in my mind. Have you guys watched Black Mass? No, on I have Netflix? Netflix. I have not. The the director of um, Haunting on Hill House. Yeah, can't remember his damn Mike name. Mike Flanagan. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah. It's basically about this little town, I think, off the coast of like Alaska or some pretty remote, pretty dried up town, you could say. And they had a a, a pastor go off on his own little venture to try and I don't know find some sort of religious epiphany or, or whatever. And he ends up in these ruins that there's like a, a horrible like storm or something like that that kind of blows away the sand to the entrance of these ruins. And it goes in there Well, he finds this creature that is for all intents and purposes, just like a vampire. It's never inscri- described in the movie or outside if it really is or what, or an angel according to him since he's a pastor. Um, but, it, but it like bites him but then allows him to drink its blood in which he becomes youthful and basically immortal as long as he drinks his blood. But he decides to take this creature back to his town and present it there and all these miracles that he's able to perform of people Mm. able to walk again and and such like that. It's really fucking cool show. Uh, It's like maybe eight eight episodes, an hour each episode, but that's kind of vampire-y thing yeah. in it. But what hey. about you, Josh? Um, I, like, one of my favorites, I mean, obviously, I have it tattooed on me, but the original Asferatu, uh, just the history that's based around that movie, I mean, that inspired so much of horror all these years later, over 100 years. Um, I also, there was one that released on Netflix last year, Blood Red Skies. That I've was a really that fun one. one. I've it heard of that, that one. I've watched that. It was a, ger- a German film that released on Netflix. It I really love the concept and it's they kind of go back to the like kind of more brutal style of vampires from like 30 days a night and stuff like that um a fun one that I feel goes under a lot of people radar it's just called suck <laughs> it's it's kind of a horror comedy but uh it's pretty much like this uh there's like a struggling rock rock band and their bassist ends up becoming a vampire and like this movie's like got Alice Cooper plays a vampire Iggy Pops in it uh Oh fuck! Uh, the guy from Black Flag. Why can't I think of his name? I can't either. Oh, what is his name? Um, Henry Rollins. He's in it. So like, it's got all these like kind of like punk rock, like and rock and roll stars in it. It's a lot of fun. No Danzig. No Danzig. 
Dan's, ex- Dan's ex- too much of a diva to yeah. do that. He's <laughs> he's he's too he's too goth for that movie. Yeah, <laughs> it's not not dark enough. <laughs> they couldn't show how short he is on camera. Yeah, <laughs> Have you, have you ever read uh, yeah, the camera the camera stand wouldn't go that way? Have, have you ever read uh, Danzig X Rollins? You ever seen that comic? Nah. There's this like uh, uh, erotic fan fiction comic that it's like a series, oh, it's like a hundred issues of just da- Glenn Danzig Jesus. and Henry Rollins like in love and like like you know do it like adventuring the world and like fighting vampires stuff. Wow. Yeah, uh, That's Henry, Henry Rollins thinks it's hilarious. Glenn Danzig not so much. Thank you guys for joining us for this. This has been a yeah, fun absolutely. episode. A good way to kick off Cult Tober sure. for us. Uh, we got a lot of stuff this month. Like I said, tomorrow, Killer Clowns, uh, Cult of Lore um, episode pretty much every day from Cult Talk Net. So make sure you guys follow us at Cult Talk Net across the board Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, uh, Threads. Uh, which is the thing that Mike set up. Um, all the things, most places at Call Talk Net. I mean, it's super simple. Uh, where can they find you guys? The the farthest reaches. Where can where can they reach you? Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, as far as social media goes, whether it be Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Threads, as well, uh, TFR Podcast. Simple as that. Um, you can also go to the farthest reaches podcast dot com. There we have uh, an online archive of all of our past episodes. You can see uh, the links uh, uh, of our sources that we have. Um, we have pictures that accompany each episode to give you a more in-depth look of what we're describing, what we're talking about on set episodes. There's even a make contact page that if you have a story that you would like to tell, uh, you can go there. I mean, you can get us on the farthest reaches podcast at gmail.com, but if you'd rather go to the make contact page on our website. And there's some questions that it'll, it'll ask you. It's a little more professional. You could say, uh, you can submit your story there. And I highly say you do so because for the farthest reaches on Halloween, we do an episode of listener tales nice. and all we do is basically just describe the stories that have been sent to us from fellow listeners and friends and the like. So yeah, if uh, you're checking this episode right now by the cult talk, conspiracy fellows please send us some stories because we need as many as possible yep we have a year to make up because we didn't do it last year <laughs> yeah Ooh, there we go yeah, yeah. double feature and uh, yeah and it's uh, we've been successful so far because i've said any story that's sent to us will be spoken on air okay Ooh. which which yeah which can be dangerous because if i get 300 <laughs> stories i'm not sure i'm gonna do it but so far so good nice. yep Nice. Well, That's there, and uh, we, have, we have also been told by a listener, the easiest way to find us on any podcast format, just type in the fart. We show up. The fart. The fart. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It shows up immediately. And I'm like, you know what? Fitting. <laughs> I love that. Uh, well, there you guys have it. Thank you for joining us. That was Matt and Josh from the Farthest Reaches podcast. Uh, Bailey and I will be back here next week. Uh, we'll be here next Tuesday with uh, the Cult of Lore who's joining us yeah. for Werewolf Encounters. So another crossover episode we're doing. So that's going to be Do fun. Um, what, uh, werewolves! Yes! Uh, you, you guys <laughs> get, yeah. The worst. Werewolf. Werewolf. <laughs> yeah. You all, you all have to check out, uh, check out um, Cult of Lore. Last year they did a Werewolves episode. Like the lore of werewolves, and I did the. And they, they do like they always do like a really nice like intro, like a you know with sound and audio and all this. And I did the werewolves uh, intro for them, and I think it sounds like shit. But everyone loves it, so we all love it. <laughs> they, they, yes, do it cu- all the time. I'm, I'm curious if if any of you are going to talk about Peter Stimp. Ooh. Peter Stimp. I don't know. I, I got I got some. I got a good one. I don't know what anyone else is doing, but I got a pretty good one. It's going to be uh, pretty deep, but. Uh, Hell yeah! You have to you, you have to you have to tune in next week to hear it. Yes. Yeah, so uh, that's what I'll be yep, doing. There you go. Uh, that's one listener we got. <laughs> so <laughs> that's all we need. But thank you guys yeah, uh, once again. Thank you for joining us, Cult Tober. Uh, follow us at Cult Talk Net for all the info. A lot of shit this month. Keep an eye on social media. So I'll be sure to post all of it. Um, that does it for us. Um, until next time, uh, I've been Ty. I've been Bailey. And 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 me. Yeah, uh, okay. yeah. I'm Matt, and I'm Josh. <laughs> 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 <laughs>